fel cynulliad, fel Senedd wedi bod yn cynnal cyfres o ddigwyddiadau drwy'r flwyddyn yma i nodi y ffaith bod yna i gymlynedd ers etholiad cyntaf cynulliad yn 1999. Uh, Dwi fel llywydd y cynulliad hwn wedi bod yn awyddus i edrych nôl i rhyw gymaint ond hefyd i edrych mlaen am yr i gymlynedd uh, nesa. Um, a dyna pam i ni yn cynnal yn gwyl ddemocratiaeth gyntaf erioed yn yr uh, Senedd dros yr tri uh, bedwar dorno uh, nesa ma mae ddydd yna drafodaeth, fydd yna gomedi, fydd yna ganu am cerddoriaeth a bydd yna pob math o elfennau sydd yn gwneud y Gymru gyfoes yr hyn i'w hi ac fe fydd yna drafodaeth ar beth yw'r heriau o'n blaenau ni a sut allwn ni gyda'n gilydd fynd ati i gwrdd ac i uh, wireddu yn breuddwydio ni dros, uh, dros Gymru. Dyna'r nod, mae hwnna'n nod y chyddau chelgeisol wedi osod uh, fyna am dri bedwar dorfnod uh, o waith. Felly heno i ni wedi um, dros, y, dros y penwythnos fe fyddwn ni'n gweithio gyda phartneriaid sydd yn hyrwyddo uh, trafodaethau a digwyddiadau uh, yn ei meysydd yn nhw. Uh, ITV Cymru, ITV Wales sydd yn uh, Noddi ac yn cydweithio gyda ni ar y noson uh, yma heno, diolch yn fawr iddyn nhw uh, am uh, hynny a fe fyddwn ni fel panel yn uh, ystyried yr um, er, uh, i gymlynedd uh, dwetha'r i gymlynedd nesa. I ni yn ffond iawn o'n galw ni'n hunain yn Class of 99. Um, I ni uh, i gyd wedi cael yn ethol yn 1999, mae gan ambell un ohono ni wedi gadael, mae yna ambell un wedi cymryd commercial break uh, yn, y, yn y canol, Dr. Dai. Um, uh, ag, um, on, ac mae'n cof ni yn amrywio o bamor dda neu beidio ni'n cofio y cyfnod cychwynol hynny. Beth bynnag, dwi'n trwsglwyddo nawr i Siôn Jenkins, fydd yn, uh, yn, yn tywys ni drwy'r uh, noson a diolch yn fawr i chi a mwynhewch gweddill y noson. Great. Great. Diolch yn fawr iawn i chi uh, llywydd a gai hefyd, es i'n croeso cynnes i chi gyd yma heno i sesiwn agoriadol wlad, gwyl Cymru'r Dyfodol. Mae ei wrthw extend a very warm welcome to you all here this evening uh, to the opening session of GLAD, Future Wales Festival, where we'll be looking back at 20 years of Welsh devolution and that big old place next door, and where we'll be uh, addressing where we are now and looking forward to the future uh, and where we're likely to go over the course of the next uh, 20 years. So quite a lot to squeeze in uh, to one hour, and I'm sure you're all looking forward to hearing from our panel here this evening. But before we get started, uh, we have a very short VT where we've managed to condense 20 years into around about two minutes. <laughs> government.
is absolutely marvellous. We waited so long for this 46 years. And the most important thing is we actually got a rail service to guard it. They wanted lawmaking powers and they got them. Can you change the law in this area? I can say, yes, we can do that, rather than we might be able to, but we've got to ask Westminster first. It might all take a, a fair bit of time. Between and Webby, Leanne Wood, Val Cleveland Dog Committee. ROV, Mark Drakeford, and Datcan, Akan Karen Kai. to make an impact and difference to Wales' youth and empower the voices of young people. Yes, many memories evoked there, I'm sure, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that a little later on, uh, Catherine Jones. But um, <laughs> yes, um, as we heard, as Eileen Jones said, um, we have here the class of 99. Um, Manchester United have the class of 92, uh, mm -hmm. but the Welsh Assembly has the class of 99, and you were, of course, all elected uh, as part of the first cohort of AMs back uh, in the first election in 1999, and you don't really need any introduction, but I will go through everyone here, uh, just, uh, just in case. We have Dr. Di Lloyd, Carolyn Jones, Ellen Jones, David Melding, and Mike German. So give them all a, a warm welcome, if you will. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, there will be an opportunity for you to ask some questions after we've had an initial discussion here. So if you do have anything you'd like to ask, please, by all means, put your hand up and I'll, I'll, I'll come to you uh, when, uh, when I can. Um, now, I must say, personally, it is a pleasure to be here this evening, but you were supposed to get Mr. Adrian Masters. Mm -hmm. um, but for some reason, Adrian said that he couldn't possibly be here today because he simply had to work. And he couldn't work from Cardiff. He had to work in London for some reason. I don't really know why. Um, but that's where he is. But he does send his apologies. And in his stead, you have somebody who doesn't yet need laser eye treatment <laughs> and uh, who has slightly less impressive facial hair. Mm -hmm. um, but I hope, I hope I'll do this evening. But my weird and blessed reward, my hand, we endorse Gary Allen Am Gwahodiad. Now, before we begin, I should give the caveat that I was only four years oh. of age <laughs> <laughs> on September the 18th, uh, 1997, when Wales went to the polls for that historic uh, referendum. And so I am very much a child of uh, devolution. I know you won't fool the children of devolution, uh, so perhaps it is apt that I am the one here sitting uh, this evening. But I'd like to start, if I may, Carwyn Jones, I'll start with you. Can we go back to 1997, to the uh -huh. campaign? Because yeah. the, the past two referenda that we've either participated in or witnessed, namely the, the referendum on our membership of the European Union and the Scottish independence referendum, they were very tense, they were very, well, they, were, they went very nice referenda oh. at times. Um, and perhaps society has been more divided after those referenda than before. But was the 1997, the build-up to the referendum, the campaign, was it as fraught as that? Was it as toxic as that campaign? No, because politics has become much more toxic for the past 20 years. It was well fought, hard fought, but uh, you, know, you didn't see the toxicity that you get now. I, mean, I was the secretary of uh, Bridgend and Ogmo, so yes. Uh, the MP for Ogmo was an anti devolution, as, as was his daughter. Janice is not here to see them, she? <laughs> At the time, <coughs> she was. So, um, and Ogmo, actually, if it had come to an so would have had the highest yes vote in Wales. Right. It was Ogmo that won the vote in Bridgend at the time. <laughs> I have to, as far as you're going to say that, that's true. But no, it was a very different campaign. Very much focused on issues rather than individuals, I felt. Uh, but very close. I remember the night of the referendum. Now, the scenes you saw there were the Park Hotel. Now, I had to work the following day, so I couldn't be there. 
And I, I, was, I rang in the Park Hotel to say that we'd won in Bridget. Mm -hmm. It was the first time they'd heard that, that, that there'd been a win in one of the, uh, the counties. But of course, as the night went on, it became more and more depressing. And uh, we saw it happening in Cardiff. Anglesey was close. You know, and at the end of it, we had Powys left to declare Gwynedd and Kamalaj. Now, we, we'd heard that Kamalaj had voted yes, but we didn't know the result. Powys wasn't as bad as people thought. Gwynedd was actually a bit better, mm. given what had happened in Anglesey. But I have to say, at that point, I'd given up. I thought, I'm going to watch this in bed. You'd given up completely? I'd given up. Yeah. I, I have, I'm going to confess it now. I was in bed. I thought, I'm going to watch the end of it anyway. And Hugh Edwards appeared on the screen saying, we hear that not only has Kamalaj voted yes, mm -hmm. But it's voted yes with a large majority, and it's not just a large majority, but it's enough to give the yes campaign victory across the whole world. Right. So I jumped out of bed. <laughs> uh, in a display of athleticism, rarely seen since. <laughs> and it was remarkable. It was very, very close. And people were, at the time, reluctant to, to make a step that they thought was in, wasn't needed. Because a lot of people said to me, well, we've got a Labour government now, so we don't need devolution. Right. And it was a tough message to, uh, to counter some of But... Here we are. Mm. But toxic, no, it wasn't toxic. Mm. Um, David Melding, I wondered, I wondered if I could ask you, um, your party was against Welsh devolution um, and campaigned so in, in 1997. Um, did you feel as though you were, the party was fighting an uphill battle from the off because mainly of the lack of Conservative MPs in Wales at the time? Well, I mean, the party very sensibly got behind a no campaign. Um, Why do you say sensibly? Well, well it's in fever, basically. And, uh, <laughs> uh, it, it would have put off a lot of uh, um, Labour voters, basically, mm. in, in the Valleys area. And, I mean, the, the story of the second referendum is, you know, Labour got their vote out. I, I think the county to vote more strongly for devolution was Neath Port Talbot, if oh, I God, recall. Yeah. You know, that's astonishing, that shift. Um, anyway, but my, uh, my personal um, uh, part was uh, uh, I campaigned and, and voted uh, um, no, but uh, it was a fairly light campaign in terms of my personal mm. involvement because it was just a few months after the general election and uh, it, it, you know, it was difficult really, I think, for my employer to uh, really uh, allow me a lot of time off, so which, and I, you know, I respected that. Mm. Um, and, you know, we were quite tired from that and, I mean, clearly, w when you get, well, we thought it was a century, sort of only a, a once-in-a-century result, but uh, as it happened, <laughs> 2001 and the 2005 uh, also fitted that pattern. But, you know, we were quite stunned. Mm. Um, but um, I, 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 mean, I think there was reasonable confidence that uh, it, it was winnable. Um, I think what really affected uh, me during the campaign is that you know Scotland voted a week before in an act mm, of utter genius mm. in terms of you know Boris Johnson had whoever advised uh, Tony Blair mm. and, uh, <laughs> uh, and and the Yes campaign in Wales about how, you know, how to stagger things and mm. uh, uh, use a process um, you know you really would have learned something valuable um, I, and so you know the Scottish result was so emphatic I I. I I, I felt quite numb by it because I thought, but well, I still went on and voted no, but I realised actually at that point, mm. with my interest in constitutional matters, um, it really would have been peculiar if Scotland had been on its own. And you, you're kind of thinking, well, if you're going to have devolution, you want it as a scheme in, uh, in Wales and then it became in Northern Ireland as soon after as part of the peace process as well. So it was, it was very, very strange. And then um, I, after the Scottish result, I was pretty sure there would be a fairly clear win mm. um, for yes. And, and, you know, I had the reverse experience then of Carbon. I was just watching it, just utterly astonished about how uh, the event, you know, was, was going on. And, uh, you know, it seemed as if we were going to win. But, um, I, you know, I, I, it was one of those things that when the result came in, I thought, well, you know, that, that's the result. I, 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 I think because of what was happening in the country, mm. I, I, I didn't really at that point feel real, you know, strong identity with, with, with a no vote at that mm. time. Mm -hmm. Though that's certainly how I voted. I mean, I thought it was, you know, it would have been strange to have suddenly changed my mind later in having campaigned. So, so I did stick with it. Mm. But... Uh, a remarkable night, yeah.
Yeah, and, and the, the, the point there about the Scottish uh, devolution referendum, I think, is, is, is a key one. And Michael, um, Ellen and, and Di, if I could ask you, how did that sort of mobilise the, the, the yes movement? You know, how, what sort of effect did it have on, on, on that? Well, I, I think it was very important. It was, it was quite deliberate at the time to have the one before the other in order to give that impression. Because um, I, I think, you know, like Calvin, um, and I, I led the campaign for our party and the links with the other parties, and we were all very, very nervous mm. about the, the way that this was, this was going. In fact, um, I have to admit to being in the ITV uh, Wales studio, and um, just when the last but three results came out, I said, well, that's it. I said, we've lost. I actually said it on air. I was very disappointed. And then suddenly we had no, this information about Carmarthenshire, and I, and I sort of woke up and smiled <laughs> and said, oh, I'm pleased to be able to change my mind, and then rushed off afterwards over to the Park Hotel, and it was pouring with rain. I can remember that bit. But the, 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 I think the, 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 the main thing is that, that that Scottish lead helped people to realise that it was achievable. Um, you know, it wasn't about, as always in referendum, we've got to be careful that people answer a different question to the one mm. that's put before them. But in the end, it's about emotion, it's about the way you feel about mm. things. And it gave people a sense that this was something that could work. And, and I think that helped it over the line, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and I, I also found that the, uh, you know, the, the no campaign um, didn't have quite the bite that I thought they would have in order to be able to hit those emotional buttons uh, in quite the same way. Uh, and I think the Scottish result was therefore was, was, a, was a lever, and without it I don't think we would have got over the line. Mm. I think um, the Scottish result was uh, obviously a boost for the uh, Yes campaign. What was um, a setback, or certainly for those of us who um, were supporting, supportive of the Yes campaign, uh, was another event in that September, mm. which was yeah, the death yeah. of Diana. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that happened a few yeah, yeah. weeks, August, um, uh, August the 30, mm. 31st. And, uh, I was in um, Barcelona, by the way, on the Ramblas. <laughs> uh, uh, you were in <laughs> And the, the, um, the waiter on the Ramblas realised that crowd I was with, didn't, had no idea what, was, what had just happened, and decided that we were German, not Welsh, and so told me, Diana ist kaputt. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that's how I heard about Diana's death, and of course as a campaigner for yes in that referendum, mm. it was obvious that mm. there would be a great um, uh, uh, mood uh, swing mm. in, throughout the UK in, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Union Jacks uh, everywhere as a result of... Uh, uh, of that um, morning, which became much more than we'd even anticipated at that, uh, at that early stage. So that made a lot of us quite nervous, I think, in the uh, Yes campaign. I learned a lot of um, lessons about Ceredigion uh, in that uh, 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 Yes campaign. I was a new, n newcomer to politics generally, not a newcomer to Ceredigion, but politics in Ceredigion. And I spent quite a bit of the campaign uh, canvassing on the phone. I learned how um, negative the Cardi farmer was to the whole idea of spending money on another tier of government. <laughs> that was a bit, a bit of a, sh a shock to me that, you know, Welsh speaking um, culturally very Welsh mm. farmers uh, would find it quite a negative thing to uh, consider voting for uh, Welsh Parliament. And uh, people who'd just moved into Wales from England would think, well, of course Wales should have its own voice. And I got very confused at that because all my stereotypes were being broken and I learned really valuable lessons about the nature of, uh, of politics and how people think um, uh, in political life. I was in the Coops in Aberystwyth on the night of the uh, result and my um, uh, my reaction to um, thinking that the vote had been lost was to drink more <laughs> in order to <laughs> forget the result and then I had to suddenly sober myself up a little so bit. So you remember the result? I, remember do, that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I do remember the result, yeah. Great. Or somebody told me the day after. <laughs> <laughs> and if we could move forward then two years later to the first elections, um, Dylois. The first election took place, the first cohort of AMs uh, were elected in that uh, pokey old uh, room. Um, it was an historic day, undoubtedly. But, this may be a bit cliche to ask this, but was it a palpably historic day? Was there a sense that this is, this is something that is happening today? This will go down in the history books. Yeah, it, it, it is. And it was palpably historic. I mean, mm. back to the night of the um, mm. referendum result, I was in Swansea uh, Brangwood Hall for the count. Uh, Swansea actually voted yes. I was one of 
the ones uh, behind the Swansea yes, says yes campaign and Swansea, the only major city, I suppose if you don't count St David's or St Asaph have voted yes in Wales for having an assembly which uh, subsequently some of us led a campaign to have the actual assembly in Swansea as a result of that. But uh, no, it was palpably uh, historic because I, I remember leaving the Brangwen Hall about 3am mm. thinking that Swansea had voted yes but Wales had voted no so we all trooped off in disappointed fashion. And, um, but we'd heard the same rumours that you've heard about Carmarthenshire and uh, in the rain um, when the Carmarthenshire results came out um, quite happy to admit shed a tear really so yes it was historic mm. otherwise if we'd lost that um, <coughs> Wales arguably could have been wiped off the map you know so in terms of um, uh, 99 yeah that was historic so it was historic um, Personally, because I wasn't expected to be elected um, <laughs> as a full-time GP, and it was a bit of a shock to the practice, really, that <laughs> I found myself being an assembly member because I, for the first two months, from the May to the July, I carried on being, uh, carry on, you know, working out my notice as a full-time GP mm. and full-time AM here. So it was a bit of a shock, but um, it was a size, you know, I was quite happy, in mm. fact, deliriously happy, to be involved in such a seismic happening for Wales and its people redressing what we'd lost six centuries earlier. Mm. Actually, that's quite a good question. Were there, did you all feel sort of rather surprised at the fact that you were elected? Or, you know, how, how did you react to, to the well, election? I, I, I only got in. Uh, I was actually surprised I hadn't resigned my job when I told my employer that it was a very distant prospect to be getting elected. <laughs> and then Geron, the chemist, won from the, and, and this basically opened up place an extra Conservative seat on, on the list because Geraint, it was one of the sweeping gains applied made in the valleys. And during the whole uh, first assembly term, I used to inquire of Geraint, you know, <laughs> what's the health of the Ron the Plaid Cymru branch? <laughs> and were they in need of any donations? That, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he always took it in good spirit. But, uh, yeah, I was astonished to get elected, utterly. Mm -hmm. And Carrie Jones, it was a Labour minority government um, at, the, at the very beginning. Um, but it was by no means clear cut, was it? It was by no means a sort of game set and match for the, for the party for that first period. No, it had been a difficult campaign. Uh, the, the leadership contest had, had, had just not gone well in terms of public perception. Uh, a lot of Labour voters decided they weren't going to vote Labour. Really? This time around, yeah. I mean, we picked up a swing to play, not as much as it turned out to be, if I'm honest, but you know, people saying, well, no, this time uh, I'm, a, I'm a protest vote, and lots of people saying, well, it's a Welsh election, now it's just different. Mm. Uh, Bridgend had had a Labour MP for, at that point, 14 years. Uh, no, 10 years, 10 years, there was an 87 election, Wynn got elected. Uh, so, I suppose I expected to win. I didn't resign my job because <laughs> I thought, mm, don't be presumptuous about this. Mm. So I, I like I combined the two for uh, for a few months. What was odd about it was the the votes were, were verified the night before, oh, right. counted the day after. Mm. So I had a good idea I won the night before. Right. So you just look at the votes. You got a good idea what's what. Uh, so it, it, I slept reasonably well. That night. Said something yeah. Then. yeah. Right. <laughs> but some of the other results. I, I remember. Uh, Wynne was there, Wynne Griffiths, who was the MP, and I said to Wynne, Wynne, I've just heard that we've lost this swing. And he said, oh, I thought, that's, that's a very you know, laid-back reaction. And then two minutes later he said, when he said lost this swing, we lost control of the council, I said, no, no, we've lost the seat in the assembly. <laughs> and his jaw dropped. <laughs> it, was, it was that sort of night. It was, it, was, it was an incredible night for, you know, it didn't help my party, but it was an incredible night in Welsh politics in terms of the way the votes so. mm. Yeah, it was probably when applied companies were successful. Though, yes, too, and I remember um, the offices laying out of the offices in uh, uh, in T Howell, mm -hmm. and the um, civil servants who had been responsible for planning some of that beforehand had got a bit carried away with uh, guessing who would win, win which seat, mm -hmm. and therefore the Ronda office had already got the Wayne David name <laughs> on the office door when Geraint <laughs> Davis, who had just been elected for Plaid Cymru, mm -hmm. turned up to the office, and it was a very fine office that Geraint Davis got as a result of taking Wayne David's office. Um, so a lesson learnt, I think, for some, some, and, and people have to never assume what the election uh, result will be and never put the name on the door before the people have cast their vote. Mm -hmm. um, 
But it, um, I, think, I think one of the things perhaps we forget as well in terms of 99 is the significance of the number of women who were elected in 1999. So we've cele celebrated last year um, 100 years of women getting the vote and uh, also being allowed to stand for, um, for election from 1918. Uh, since, from 1918 until 1999, only I think it was seven um, women had been elected in Wales at all to the House of Commons, mm. just seven. Overnight in 1999, 24 women were elected into mainstream Welsh politics and into the National Assembly. And those women then became um, spokespeople and government mm. ministers. Alan Michael's first cabinet had four or five women in very big portfolio areas, key portfolio uh, areas, so there was huge transformation really in terms of how politics in Wales sounded and looked um, with that election and I think we forget that sometimes how mm -hmm. significant that election was in changing the game in Wales in terms of numbers of women involved in active politics um, caveat we still got a long way to go though yeah. there still aren't enough women in uh, po uh, politics to get close to the um, uh, uh, gender equality we need. The Assembly on the whole has, uh, has, uh, has uh, kept up on that, but uh, Westminster and in particular local councils uh, have a far too low a percentage of women councillors, only around 27% still. Mm. And, and there certainly were teething problems during that uh, first year, um, objective one funding of course, European issues um, causing problems uh, back way back then, 20, 20 years ago. Um, did, I mean, the, the vote was, of course, it was a very slim vote for yes in 97, but how much did those teething problems affect the lack of trust that the Welsh people had in the institution? I think it was very important in that very first year, um, as we hit um, crisis, mm. and there were several that we hit, but political and, and external, um, as we hit the crisis, I think there was a feeling that everyone felt that we needed to uh, support this nation, uh, the body that was was emerging for, from it from uh, uh, as, uh, as a little beginning. It was like a family child, really. We had we, we had to manage that. So I think there was an understanding, though it was it, you know there were still quite brutal conversations and, and dialogue. There was an understanding that we needed to make this work. And if it, if, it, if it foundered because we couldn't make it work, if we founded on uh, controversy, if we founded on, uh, on not making uh, uh, progress, then it was a danger that, that people would turn away from it and we would not have that support. So it was balancing those two things together that, that I think was part of that first, that first period. Mm. You earlier asked about the building itself, mm. uh, uh, whether that had an impression. I, I, we went in uh, we know, knowing that we were going to have something better. Mm -hmm. So that was, it was temporary. I think but what gave us the confidence, much more confidence, was that civil society engaged a lot with us. We were, there were all, you could come out of the chamber and there were always people there from organizations to lobby you. It was, in fact, it became a, 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 a hub of activity as a place, even though it wasn't perfect. So I think that actually gave us a lot of, um, a lot of lift. Though the actual formal opening, which was by the Queen and then um, I can remember outside my window Michael Ball singing and rehearsing all afternoon um, and you know, making it very difficult to be able to do anything else at all. But that event, with, with the lights and, the, and the, the glitz that went with it, actually I think that was the, 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 the big starring moment when, you know, we're here and we're staying. Mm -hmm. And David Lodding, how were the, I mean, excuse me, this may, be, may well be because I'm sorry and I don't remember, but how were the Conservatives how did they react to that particular time, the crisis, uh, this, new fa this new institution, the Conservatives of back no? Was it a case of, well, you voted for it, so this is what you get? Wait, wait, the official history now is that <laughs> we, we, were, we were principled and democratic yeah. and immediately accepted the referendum was up. But actually, it was a pretty fierce uh, uh, work in progress. Um, so the, the party was fundamentally divided between those that wanted to push very quickly for a second referendum. Unfortunately for them, you know, the party was still toxic, so it had no real uh, uh, from us 
um, sort of recommendation in it uh, for the public. But the public themselves did not want a second referendum. It was, it was so unlike the Brexit result. Mm. Because people had voted, you know, very, very narrowly, obviously, but I mean, there was, you know, what are they voting for? An assembly, you know, it was not difficult to interpret that. Um, and then, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the other half, really, of the party, um, uh, you know, wanted uh, to use the assembly to, um, you know, be a real force in Wales and to, uh, to rebuild and to detoxify the, the party brand, essentially. Uh, then uh, the members voted uh, for Rod Richards as leader. The late Rod Richards, I'd, you know, I can refer to his leadership a bit. He, you know, he died recently, so I, I, I don't want to be too bitter in my uh, uh, recollection of his his leadership. But I mean, Rod had a very firm view, which was uh, uh, that that we should be quite strong opponents of the uh, the political elite and uh, and the whole concept really of uh, um, of, of devolution and. Um, uh, and the members went for him over uh, Nick Bourne, um, but most of the candidates who got elected were, you know, had, had supported Nick and were from the side of the party. I suppose, you know, fortunately, the people that really wanted to get elected, you know, and came forward, were committed to the institution, um, and and that worked its way out. I mean, Rod's you know leadership lasted about nine months. Mm. And we fought on an exorable uh, manifesto called Fair Play for All which included the fair phrase, or I'm not sure if it made the final draft, I think it did, uh, linguistic apartheid, and so uh, about <laughs> half of the candidates in winnable seats had written a collective letter to him nice. saying that we disassociate ourselves from, uh, uh, from you know, this wording. Um, so we were horribly divided, mm. um, and the group meetings you know, were, were very, very tense, to put it mildly. Um, but, you know, things moved on quite quickly, actually. It wasn't like months, was it? It, it, it was even less his, his leadership. Mm. Um, so, uh, um, uh, uh, and then uh, the, the party did, the, you know, formally accept the, the referendum and we made those statements. You know, so that was the year 2000. And it really wasn't until about 2005 that we were in the territory of, well, how do we make uh, devolution flourish and look mm. at lawmaking powers and... Uh, and, and having proper balance between executive and legislature, legislative powers, because you know, Wales had the most incredible uh, devolution design. We had a, 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 a really quite powerful government. The Welsh government is always, you know, its executive powers are always fairly extensive. And you just, you know, you were talking about uh, the whole objective one stuff, mm. and then this incredibly weak legislature. I and mean, it was so mm. unlike any Westminster model anyway. And, and that's what I used to talk about, to saying, well, if you've got it, you may as well have a proper balanced version of it. But, um, yeah, it was a good six years, I think, before we really settled in. Well, I was going to say, it took until perhaps 2006, then, is it fair to say, for the Wales, uh, government, Governance of Wales Act, until devolution, perhaps, was, a, was even anywhere where it could start to live its potential, to, 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 to deliver? Well, yeah, I mean, it was set up as a... As a, as a like a county council, really, isn't it, effectively, yeah, at, at the one. start, basically, mm. until the Government of Wales Act in 2006. And then uh, in 2006 as well, we, we moved into the new mm. Senate building. So there was a bit of a radical transformation in, in that year. And uh, But obviously, it was the later referendum in 2011 mm. when we gained primary legislative The first powers. vote I ever made, actually. Was yeah, and, and yeah. the, I mean, I know the, the adjective uh, overwhelming is overused these days, but, you know, that result in terms of um, the Senate having um, you know, lawmaking powers of its own for the first time mm. since 1405 or thereabouts um, was actually overwhelming. 64% mm. said yes and 36%. Now that is what I would say is an overwhelming uh, endorsement and uh, that's where we are. Really. Mm -hmm. And then the plan coming in 2007, um, uh, the uh, coalition, um, finally got, got itself into a position where it was able to make some, make some big decisions in Wales. Yeah, and it was, um, it, it, it was a steep learning curve for Plaid Cymru. Plaid Cymru had been quite comfortable, possibly, in being a party of opposition as politicians. It's quite straightforward to be complaining about various issues to government ministers and calling for this and having a go about something else. And then all of a sudden, we were not just a party of, of government, and somebody like me was a minister in that government, but it was a um, it was a different discipline that a, part, a party such as us that had not been in government, obviously in Westminster, not been in government 
uh, in Wales had to adopt straight away. But it was, a, I think, a hugely rewarding experience for Plaid Cymru in how we adapted to that. I think the One Wales uh, coalition between Plaid Cymru and Labour was a particularly productive um, government in that, uh, in that period. It allowed you to have free reign as, a, as an yeah, opposition, we were the official opposition. Opposition, <laughs> official, uh, opposition. And I think that um, uh, it created a, a kind of model, well, the most important thing, of course, uh, of that uh, legacy is that it did deliver the 2011 referendum, uh, referendum because that was the primary um, uh, key then that was the key to creating that coalition rather than the rainbow color coalition although there were lots of issues that happened at that point of coalition discussions but what made both um, certainly Plaid Cymru stick with the whole idea of working with Labour on that was that Labour um, in power in Westminster at the time uh, could provide um, the assurance that uh, a referendum would deliver the primary legislative uh, powers and um, that was a very positive um, period of government, but also a uh, constitutionally significant uh, time as well in delivering primary le uh, legislative uh, powers, because it, is, it transforms what you were able to do when you were able to actually create legislation without reference to another legislature. Previously, of course, we, we'd have to create legislation in tandem with um, the uh, Westminster Parliament. I led what was called at the time um, uh, legislative competence. Elcos. 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 I can only remember the acronym, Elcos. I read the red meat Elco through the assembly as uh, the Minister for uh, Agriculture. It was the most duplicative, most um, annoying system um, and so time consuming and wasteful of resources, both MPs and AMs scrutinising the same piece of legislation on on a very small area, so um, it, it's been quite excruciating, actually, actually getting to a point where 20 years later we have full primary legislation powers and we now have tax varying uh, uh, powers. It's been a you know good old slog <laughs> to get the political consensus to get us uh, there, um, uh, but we, you know we don't give up. Mm -hmm. A political yeah. slog, Karen Jones. You were the first minister in 2011. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Hard-fought battle, was it? Or? Well, in, in my party, things had changed in 2007 with the coalition. There had been quite a bitter battle within the party about going to the coalition applied. There had been a, a conference in the CIA, as it was then, where um, you know, there was a fair bit of rancour in that conference. In the end, uh, it d decided to support the coalition. Mm. And that's when, in some ways, there was more of a shift of power back to Cardiff, mm. um, and less so in Westminster. If you want my honest opinion, I think eh, we would have struggled to have that referendum if the Labour Party had won in 2010. Really? Yeah. There was still a very strong uh, opposition to the part to uh, further devolution with amongst the MPs, not amongst the membership, because the Labour Party changed completely. I mean, we, we were you know, very uncomfortable with devolution at the start of the process. By the end of it, they'd elected a crypto nationalist as their leader. So it was, uh, you know, the party, I'd never have been elected as, as, as a leader of Welsh Labour you know, at the end of the 90s. But my views would have been seen as too extreme. But amongst the MPs, there was opposition, and I don't know whether we would have had the referendum. David Cameron was supportive. Mm. Uh, Cheryl Gillan wasn't. She oh, was really? the secretary. No, she wasn't. She Did wasn't it surprise supportive. you that he was supportive? He was neutral. He said, "Well, it seems pretty sensible to me, you know." And um, so there, it was because of that that we had the referendum. Right. I have to say, I was nervous about the timing because I thought March, I don't know, just before an election, it'll be dark, and it was difficult to get people out to vote. Seven o'clock, I was knocking doors in Bridgend, and people were saying, "We're going to win anyway," because mm. it was oh, people, people assumed that because it was such a big, big lead in the opinion polls, you couldn't get people out to vote. Mm. Maybe now it's dark, now the conversation is on in a minute. And that did have an effect, and I thought mm, July for me would have been, I think, a, a better time. But, you know, I, I, it, we, we did it. Uh, all four major parties were behind it. That was mm. important. It was us against an inflatable pig, if I remember. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I just remember all oh, vividly. We had a, uh, a, an event, it was a, t a TV uh, question time in Blackwood where Roger Lewis, who was then the chief mm -hmm. executive of the WIU and myself were on one side, and I forget who was on the other, it was um, 
and Ethan Gill was one, that's right, and there was, there was somebody else. And in the audience was a group of UKIP supporters who were dead against evolution. And this man asked me a question, and he was dressed in a yellow fishing coat. I don't remember, like an old style <laughs> trawler man. And um, he said, right, he said, I want to know from Carolyn Jones, if we, if we vote for this, will our taxes go up? I said, no. And he went, that's all we get from politicians, waffle, waffle, waffle. And he said that. <laughs> that's what he said. He was so taken aback that he said, no. I, I, I've always said this in politics. If I can answer a question directly, I'll, I'll just say it. Because yeah. I spent 10 years in court. You have to do it that way. And I remember, I remember that vividly. But there was no doubt we were going to win. Mm. I, you know, we were surprised to do so well in something. Flinch had flipped completely the other way. Uh, Wrexham the same, Munmusha almost, almost. But to be honest, if you'd looked at the map of Wales in 1999 after the referendum, it looked very much like the map of Wales in the 13th century. Norman Wales, Welsh Wales. Mm -hmm. That's what it looked like. Mm -hmm. That disappeared. And I think in many ways, the geographical divisions of seven centuries disappeared that day. Mm -hmm. I know we have, I'm conscious of time, we have 15 minutes left, I think. So if anyone in the audience does have a question, please do uh, raise, your, raise your hand. Yes, I'll, I'll come down here. Yes, fire away. Yeah, I mean, Ellen touched on it earlier, uh, talking about the gender. Oh, we have a, sorry, we have a microphone. Oh. Sorry. Okay. There we go. Yeah, Ellen touched on it quickly earlier about talking about the um, increase in the number of women in politics with the advent of the assembly. And I've just been interested to hear about what tangible difference that made whether that be to the tone of debate, the style of debate, but also policy making and, and the types of policy that came out of the Assembly. Well, I'd only say that I would, I'm not... I'm not sure whether any of us uh, are able to answer that because mm. we've known no different. You know, mm. we were mm. elected into a place where women and men were almost um, uh, uh, equal numbers uh, from uh, from the start. Um, many people have commented about the tone um, of debate and about the ability of um, women to work possibly across political parties. Um, I remember the, the first assembly there were men there who would come from uh, Westminster or the House of Commons whose tone was particularly aggressive. Rod Richards was one, um, David Wigley, Alan Michael, I was surprised he's so gentle looking these days. Um, I remember him shouting like anything uh, in, in uh, that chamber. I've heard women shout as well, of course. We had a bit of that this afternoon, actually. Um, uh, but on the whole, you know, I think that it was important for me from the start, and I come from an economic development background, it was important for me as a woman politician not to identify myself solely with issues that were traditionally identified with women. And I think that the Assembly on the whole has seen that women have taken part in all aspects. They've been chairs of finance, they've been finance ministers, they've been showers, and the one job left really is the <laughs> first minister uh, role but for me actually it's I more important it. <laughs> it's more important to have women doing everything and and all things rather than just the token top job as we've mm. seen with Theresa May and Margaret Thatcher maybe you know that just isn't enough to do it that way you have to the influence has to be right um, right throughout mm. any other questions don't only ask oh. the women questions. No, absolutely. No, I yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes. I'm conscious of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Uh, Cash and I'm just wondering, so I'm going to get this from the Westminster again, things are kicking off, but it's a big Boris and And I'm just wondering, how can or can the Assembly capitalise on what's happening with sort of so chaos? Like, how will the work, how will the Assembly be put through? When all attention is drawn there, yeah, can the Assembly goes offer something different from that, and how do we get an answer to that? I'm going to ask Mike, Michael yeah. if he has any ideas, because you... Uh, well, well, I, I think, I think what's happening at the moment, and I, you know, if I were to stand apart from the political melee and look down at what's happening around me in, in Parliament, I'd say that the, 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 the tree is being shaken well and truly of not just the way in which our democracy is run, but also, more importantly, the way in which our people are represented and the representation that they have doesn't seem to fit the structure of the, of the society that we are. 
that's something that I've always been passionate about. That we, you know, that, uh, that we've got a, a rigid structure in politics which hasn't fitted where people have been going, and that journey that people are on now certainly the politics doesn't fit. So one of the things that I think that the National Assembly offered quite in, in, interestingly, because it's not a full proportional representation system, but it certainly is a more proportional system, is that it, it, it actually made people, force people to work more closely together when people had to in order to take forward the agenda. And I wonder whether two things might, that, we, that, that, the, that the Assembly experience might influence what's happening, and one of them might be that we might see a, a restructuring of our political base, the way in which political parties are represented. I mean, I, I won't tell you which party it is, but I can, it's probably it's both of them actually. I walk into the door and I see colleagues and I say good morning and they say what's good about it. Yeah. And, and that, that was, that it's been that case internally in people's own parties as well, both in the Labour Party and the Conservative Party. So I wonder whether it, the message of working together, the message of having to deliver something which requires uh, a, a bit of uh, commitment and a bit of, uh, you know, bending yourself to ma make things work, <coughs> is, is a real lesson that we could take from, from the National Assembly. And I hope, by the way, that it will lead to a different structure of our political system and hopefully proportional representation in London. Well, I, I think what, one of the consequences of what's happening in Westminster now is, is people in the street, because when we speak to our constituents, they think, do, is a mess in Westminster event. And, well, the feeling is, well, actually, you couldn't make more of a mess of it in Cardiff then, because people are traditionally, you know, if you're not particularly, particularly politically aligned, have thought, well, it's okay, you've got something little there in Cardiff, there, there, keep, keep a boys and girls happy, you know, but now it's, it's been seen in a, in a sort of different frame, really, saying, well, actually, the boys and girls in Cardiff Bay can hardly make a worse job than what's happening up there now. So uh, that's part of the reason why there's a resurgence in this idea that actually Wales actually could do things, you know, because we've always been browbeaten with the way that um, you know, the media runs in this country, that's the mother of parliaments, you know, supremely has got power and wisdom extending back over eight centuries and stuff. Whereas everything else is a little bit, you know, late in the day and a bit sort of, you know, amateurish. Well, actually, Lots of people are refocusing now, thinking, well, actually, there's a right humdinger of a mess. What are we going to do about this? Well, actually, focus on Wales. Focus on the Senate. Yeah, I, I think what's changed is that 20 years ago, you'd knock a door and people would say, oh, God, the Assembly is the council, isn't it? And moving on stilts. Now, the sham, of course, the first year was not, not brilliant. Uh, no, it's the other way around. Mm. I get people saying to me, well, you know, this thing's a stable in Cardiff, look at Westminster, what a mess that is. Mm. Uh, I take my pleasure in that, incidentally, you know, I, I look at you know, commons and the laws and I go to the last place they want to be in, is, is, is either of those places at the moment. And it's a serious, but, but it's a serious, oh, it's, it's, no, 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 thank you. Um, no, thank you. I'm, 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 I think, the, the, the problem we have now is that there are, there are two things, he said humbly, that I said in 2016 that unfortunately have come true. First one I said is Ireland, Ireland, Ireland. Mm -hmm. And people couldn't understand why I kept on going on about Ireland and its border. The reason is my wife's a Belfast Catholic. And sure enough, here we are, the Irish border is, is, the, is the sticking point that can't be resolved uh, with any current proposals. And secondly, I said then, and I'll say, I'll say it again here, a bad Brexit carries with it the breakup of the UK, the seal of the breakup of the UK, which you know, I, I would not want to see. I think Di is right. I think what's happening in Westminster is driving what's called indie curiosity. I do come across people who say to me, well, you know, maybe it's worth looking at. They're not in favour, but they're not dead against as they used to be. And I think I don't think the chaos in Westminster is a good basis in which to build the independence movement, but nevertheless, that's what's, that's what's driving people. And it doesn't, it is not good for anybody in any party or any part of the UK to see Westminster as such a mess. It's not good for anybody. So for me, unfortunately, what I'm seeing at the moment is what I've said before actually happening. You know, if you look at the opinion polls in Northern Ireland, if there was a hard border, the majority of people would vote to join the South. And the reason for that is that now, 
compared to 25 years ago, when people, even Catholics in the North, saw the Republic as this sort of conservative, backward, poor, you know, priest-dominated country, and it did. It's now the exact opposite. The South is a prosperous, liberal, open country. Why not join the Republic? And that's driving a generation of Protestants particularly who have no memory of the Troubles. Scotland, well, I mean, Scotland goes, what's left doesn't work. You can't have England and Wales. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, and I've, I've said it before publicly, you know, the, the great um, issue that we may have to face, I hope not, but we may have to face, is that we become independent whether we like it or not, chaotically. Because England says, we're off to be independent now. You lot over there, you subsidy junkies in Wales, as it'll be portrayed in the media, you go off on your own. This is territory that if you'd said this to me 20 years ago when we started, I would have thought ridiculous. It's fantastic we have a tax varying lawmaking parliament. I remember writing a pamphlet in 2003 calling for it. Martin actually had to, uh, to edit it. And it was a dangerous nationalist pamphlet on some of my party. Most of it's come true, actually, but there we are. <laughs> to get to that point, both in terms of the people of Wales and my party to where we are now, has been, you know, it's been a long and sometimes difficult journey. But I do now worry. Uh, those of us, David and myself, for example, who've made the case for constitutional change, because it's broken completely, for a more equal partnership with countries within the, within the UK, for a more federal structure. England's the problem because it's so big. Yeah, we've been saying this for a long time, and now it's, it is now the only option uh, unless you want to see the UK break up. And, you know, the best time, I think, for us, uh, both in Wales and the UK, was late 90s, early 2000s, when things were fairly stable. And now we, we are in a, in a very, very bad situation. It's a critical mess. Causing Westminster, I take no pleasure in that because I don't think, any, I don't think it helps any of us to see that happening. But I'm sure they've sorted it all out by now. <laughs> One final question. Yes, Martin, you wrote a, you wrote a book yeah. in two, um, about, about the first 10 years of, uh, of the Welsh Assembly, famously, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'd just like to... Um, inject uh, not a negative but a cautionary note. Um, everyone's talking about the uh, Assembly as if it is a settled institution and that it's the will of the Welsh people that it should last forever and you know, dance off into the sunset etc. What we have to remember is that in no election since the Assembly was founded that more than 50% of the people voted in uh, such an election. We're also in a very um, difficult time um, where all sorts of political possibilities become more manifest than they've ever been before. And Brexit has brought in this totally toxic um, approach towards politics. It's, it's just so much nastier now than it ever was. Um, and we're not quite sure where that negative energy is going to go and I wouldn't rule out that it goes in the direction of people saying, let's abolish the assembly. Um, and one further point that I'd make here is, from a historical point of view, really, going back to 1997, at the time of the referendum campaign, it was obviously important to win that campaign. And I think everybody who was campaigning for it and was in favor of it knew that it was going to be tight and it wasn't going to be easy. Therefore, promises were made about what the Assembly was going to be able to deliver in terms of the economy, in terms of public services. And in a sense, I think that people overreach themselves because things are not easily de deliverable. We know from our experience now for 20 years that actually dealing with some of these long-term intractable problems in terms of poor health, in terms of getting decent jobs, in terms of skilling people take far longer than just an assembly term. You're talking about decades to put things right. And therefore I think that because those promises were made at that referendum, people were thinking immediately the assembly got underway, oh, we're going to see action now, we're going to see things change for the better very quickly. And of course, what happened, and I was around at the time, was that in those early years, People were thinking, and I'm a journalist, and I, I'm as guilty of this as anyone else, being impatient and saying, what is happening here? And, and I remember my, writing stories about David Ellis Thomas, who was the presiding officer, coming out with statements like, I get up in the morning, uh, I shave my face, I wash my face, and I think, what the hell am I doing going down to that place? Because very little 
was actually happening, mm. certainly in the first year. And I think that that legacy from those uh, overreaching promises in the very early days have lingered all the way down through the history of the Assembly to this day. And so the important thing is that with the new powers that the Assembly's got, uh, that everyone is there operating on top form in order to deliver a better Wales. Mm. I've actually sort of stolen my last question. I was going to ask, is the Assembly safe? You know, is, the, is it safe for, for the next 20 years, for the next 50, 100 years? Because we do see the rise in, I think, the opinion polls for the Abolish the Assembly uh, Party have been creeping up over the past uh, year. Yeah. I, yeah, very small, but they, they are nonetheless uh, creeping up. So is the Assembly as we know it safe, or does it need change, perhaps radical change in some, in some aspects? Chloe, may, may I go that a few? Well, I think that there's the possibility that a negative energy could um, uh, could uh, uh, take hold of and abolish the uh, assembly movement. There's also a very positive energy that um, that could take um, hold of getting rid of Westminster rule in um, in uh, Wales as well. So there are competing forces at, at at play here, and they are uncertain times. And just as um, Di, I think, referred earlier to the fact that um, Westminster chaos is fueling a, um, uh, the indie curious and uh, indie certain uh, uh, element of uh, political uh, debate. There is always the need to um, make sure that we're taking all people with us, not just um, uh, some people. And yes, it was a time of um, of hope and cool Cymru. It wasn't just around the assembly. I, you know. The World Cup, uh, the Rugby World Cup, the Millennium Stadium, the, mil the Millennium, it was, you know, it was a very positive time. And then, of course, you know, I, I'd have to say that the fact that, you know, I, I, I was elected in 99 to an institution that had less fiscal powers than the Aberystwyth Town Council uh, that I just left. Um, you know, so the reality of the, you know, the ability of the place, it was over-talked up by some, um, as we were selling it during a 1997 referendum, you know, there's no uh, doubt about that. But I think, you know, we c the assembly as an institution cannot be popular in everything it does or government within it does. I always thought that um, you know, it would never properly prove itself um, to the people of Wales or be there for the people of Wales until it had its first farmers' protest, and we had one of those quite early on with the export of live calves, mm -hmm. um, and its first, you know, Fred Francis from Cymdeitha mm -hmm. um uh, holding a hunger strike outside the Senate building, you know, yeah. that, um, <laughs> so we became the place of protest and debate, and, and yes, we achieved much, um, but we, we didn't achieve everything, and that's part of the political and party political uh, dynamic, and we shouldn't be afraid of, um, of, um, of recognising that democracy is not perfect, and democracy in Wales isn't perfect, and policy um, uh, application is not perfect in Wales, and, um, you know, we haven't touched on it, and there's no time, um, but on the whole, there hasn't been the, you know, there hasn't been a change of government or leadership of that government from the one party as well, and and a lot of creativity comes from the, the um, the <coughs> challenge and the in manifestos and the uh, competitive ideas in manifestos from different political uh, parties as well, and you know that's something else that is a feature of the last twenty years. <laughs> So we should always have the last word, I oh, guess. Yeah. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, I think we'll, we'll tie things up there We're a little over time. But first, well, can I thank you, the panel, the five of you, for being here this evening? Really do appreciate it. Diolch yn Diolch Can I thank you all for your uh, for your kind uh, attendance here this evening? Uh, and uh, hope to see you all. Well, this, the, the, the events are going on over the next three days, I believe, um, for, uh, for GLAD, uh, this democracy festival. So, yes, if you want any more information, please do uh, ask uh, Manon, and see at the back there, <laughs> and others. Um, but, uh, yes, so please enjoy the rest of the festival. And just to, just to say, many of you, um, if not all of you, are invited now to Fresh for the official launch of GLAD. Um, I was reminded of the fact that 
drink um, and alcohol um, uh, was part of the, 19, uh, of the 1997 uh, referendum campaign evening. It wasn't for you, Karen, you were working the next day, but I was, it wasn't for me. So if you want to join us for a more uh, informal discussion uh, on uh, 1999 to 2099, then join us in fresh. Don't worry, David. Oh,